My parents killed people. A lot of people. Walter and Martha Friendly were their names. Their crimes formed their legend. And yes, that was their real last name. Call it a stroke of irony and two lives defined by sadistic massacres and bloodshed. Together my mom and dad ravaged the state of Georgia. They had met in their early 20s in Stanwick, Georgia. And their minimum wage jobs soon turned into an illustrious career as serial killers. The moment that Walter helped Martha hack up her parents with an arsenal of kitchen knives, well, that was the catalyst for the crime spree. And from there, they never looked back. Like a touring rock band, they took their show of torture throughout the state. Their performances ranked from hacking up families to dismembering an old man, to dissecting teenage couples out on Lover's Lane. The friendlies led a tour of gore. They lived paycheck to paycheck by stealing whatever they could from their victims. But aside from obsessed fans, Mama and Daddy's band also had to evade the police. And they did so skillfully. Their array of disguises and own clever ingenuity made them a George of Bonnie and Clyde. And quite often, they would vanish into the dark night like the terrifying ghosts that they were. Martha and Walter were an attractive couple. Black, young, and wild and free. Killers without a cause. My mom had more masculine features. She was a tomboy who was just as tall as my dad. Scrawny with short cropped hair. But she had a sexy face. Radiant eyes from what I could remember. Only somebody as pretty as her could pull off those baggy jeans and t-shirts. But it was really her toughness that drew Walter in. She was a farm girl after all. Just a year older than mom, Walter could be flashy but emotional. A glam rocker psychopath. He kept a stylish fade haircut, wore huge glasses, and always kept his slender frame and colorful clothes. Like the brash movie star to mom's shrewd director, he displayed his boyish smile as often as he could. And dad looked to Martha as being more than just a girlfriend. She was his partner in crime, his support system, the logical leader to their exploits. Her strength inspired him. She kept Walter under her protective shield and from what I understood, her bossiness was the major reason for their success. A bossiness that I heard even carry over to the bedroom. I knew they both had heart. At least towards the few people they showed compassion to. But above all, they just wanted to take care of each other. They wanted to take care for their blossoming family. Soon my parents' body count grew higher than their combined age. Even after mom had me in 2001, the killing spree didn't stop there. Instead, the friendly family only grew bigger. And stronger with the addition of me. And their daughter Blair. I grew up on the run, like a gory family vacation. Martha and Walter led me from city to city, leaving a sea of bodies behind in our wake. Maybe I was too young to be exposed to this horror, but instead of trauma, I felt excitement. My mind was too young to comprehend my parents' sickening acts. I was just an innocent kid, even on my family's killing spree. At the time, I was a wide-eyed little girl with pigtails, gap teeth, and a little belly. I had mama's piercing eyes and dad's big smile. But I was a tomboy like Martha. My wardrobe across between mama's practical comfort and daddy's visual flair. Everywhere that they went, I went. I was a curious kid so the killing never scared me. Instead, mom and dad's murders fascinated me. They brought us closer. Martha and Walter raised me well. They made me grow up quick without sacrificing the carefree joys of childhood. We always had fun. Until we were torn apart. In February 2006, we came back to Stanwick, Georgia. A hometown stop during our never-ending gore tour. 
Around 9 o'clock, my dad drove us out to the outskirts of the city. Well past the suburbs and the last chance gas station. Like a nocturnal monster, daddy's jet black Toyota blended into the night. We made our way towards our final destination. An upper middle class country home. The place had three acres, no dogs, just a nice brick house completely isolated on Buckley Drive. We already had the plan set, something a little bit different than usual. Instead of just having me watch, Daddy and Mom were going to have me really help them. I was eager, even honored. For once, I was going to really be part of the team, part of the grown-ups, part of the bloodbath. Killing the headlights, Daddy parked right outside the house's dirt driveway, right by a mailbox decorated with bird illustrations. I sat in the back seat. Mommy and Daddy were up front. They both wore dark jeans and black gloves. Mom in her orange windbreaker, Dad in his red hoodie. Dad had wanted to wear his black leather jacket, but Mama shot the idea down. No need for style when we're gonna go killing. Mama would say. Of course, it didn't stop Daddy from bringing along two masks for the festivities. A smiling suburban dad mask for Walter. And an obnoxious suburban mom mask for Martha. Both of them were Caucasian middle class caricatures. Cartoony cutouts brought to life. I just wore a green Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle sweater. Some green sweatpants and Velcro sneakers. Yeah, I was dressed to kill. Like a child about to go through a haunted house, excited anticipation conquered me. The friendly family murders were the perfect combination of heightened atmosphere and amusement park thrills. At least to a naive five-year-old like me, the kills were just exhilarating, carefree fun. Walter slid on his mask. Turning, he looked at me. And even behind the dad mask, I could see enthusiasm living in his eyes. You ready, Blair? Walter asked in a striking southern accent. My job was simple. Just knock on the front door. A few simple knocks. The pumping adrenaline kept me warm. I stood on the house's front porch. Right on the doormat with the bold G on it. Just a little girl all alone on this chilly dark night. The blinds were lowered on all of the windows. I had nothing but a few rocking chairs and tall bushes for company. Behind me, darkness covered the trim front lawn, along with the animal lawn ornaments hibernating out there. Nothing but a thick forest surrounded the area. Miles and miles of woodland. Like a warrior confronting a ferocious beast, I faced the tall front door. Through an eternal loop, Daddy's words of encouragement played through my mind. I knocked. A commotion started inside the house. I could hear a TV, a couple talking, even footsteps. A dim porch light cut on. All the signs of life that I needed. And determined, I knocked once more. Louder this time. The door swung open. Shining in from inside, bright lights hit my calm face. A middle-aged white man stood there. He was tall with short curly hair and glasses. The college professor type. Dressed in pajama pants and a blue sweater. He leaned down towards me. Behind him, I caught a glimpse of the lavish house awaiting us inside. There was pristine furniture, artistic ornaments, a large TV. The place looked stylish, cultured. I could see the man's nervous wife sitting on the couch. She was the same age as him, long red hair and blue eyes, dressed in silk pajamas. She was more of the strict professor, rather than the laid-back hippie vibes that her husband gave off. Concerned, the tall man reached out towards me. Hey, it's okay. He said in a soft tone. Are you alright? I just stared at him. I showed no expression or emotions. Just like I was taught. Are you okay? 
The man said, Max, what's wrong? I heard his wife say in a trembling voice. I didn't move. My blank eyes stared at the man. The man's worried eyes scanned the front yard. Where are your parents? Emerging from the bushes, Daddy swarmed towards the porch. Startled, the middle-aged man turned and looked on at that unforgiving mask. The man didn't stand a chance. Nobody would. Walter jammed the butcher knife straight into his glasses. The blade broke through the lens's fragile barrier, sinking straight into the man's brown eye. I heard him unleash a loud, agonizing scream. The shattered glasses were a broken shield. Like a javelin, the knife's wooden handle stuck straight out of his face. Blood spurted out in droves. Crimson sprayed all across Daddy's mask. Over the beaming smile, a red dose now decorated the cheap plastic. I got you. Walter hollered with deranged glee. His hands grasping at the knife, the dying man staggering back inside. His wife's screams rang through the night. I didn't know how to react. I had never gotten this close to the kill, never this involved. Simultaneous joy and confusion swirled through my young mind. Even a smile spread across my face. The man fell to the living room floor, his body dead in a blood red sea. Ready for more, Walter rushed inside the house. I felt mom push me in behind him. Get in, she yelled. Her right hand held a revolver. We entered the living room, the house a warm and cozy reprieve from the cold. The living room was sprawled out before us like a stage. I saw a long hallway in the corner. Several framed pictures showed a happy nuclear family. The dead man, the father. Horrified, the man's wife kept screaming from the couch. No, she cried. There on the floor lay her dead husband. He was lifeless and still. His arms lay at his side like a bloody snow angel. Crimson covered his clothes and his crushed glasses. The TV played 1964's Stray Jacket. A black and white serial killer movie complete with spooky music, ferocious screams, and axe murders galore. Plopped down right in front of the TV was the couple's stunned 10-year-old son. He was skinny with black hair, wearing a Superman t-shirt and pajama pants. The boy had his mother's worried face. His toy monsters were gathered right in front of him, but he just stared at us. The boy as wide-eyed as me. Only we were in much different positions. In a sadistic flourish, Daddy yanked the knife straight out of the man. Blood and glass shot out like an erupting volcano. In a thick trickle, redness poured from the man's fatal wound. Oh, God! The wife yelled. No, please! Mama slammed the door behind us, sealing off this unlucky family from the outside world. Now they were trapped with us. An awkward third wheel, I stood behind Mama and Daddy. I had no mask or weapon, just a timid little girl, one with a morbid curiosity. My parents' eerie masks formed a terrifying team, and their faces plastic nightmares. Tears sliding on her face, the woman turned and looked towards the hallway. No. Like a crazed showman, Walter put the knife to her quivering face. She faced the sharp blade. No, leave us alone, please. Desperate, she reached towards her son. Elliot. Martha aimed at the little boy. Fueled by panic, the wife jumped off the couch. Elliot. Cackling, Daddy grabbed the woman's arm, holding her back. Look at him, he yelled. No, the wife cried. She struggled to break away, but she didn't have a chance. Let go of me. All I could do was watch. The little boy stared back at me, her eye contact brief but intense. And then Mama's bullet ended it all. 
Blood and brain bits splattered over the TV. Stray jacket not colorized with a vivid red. The tormented cries of the boy's mother could even be heard over the gunshot. Her chorus of grief raged through the house. No! She screamed. Elliot! The little boy fell into his toys. His face a scribbled drawing of splattered flesh. Blood stuck to all of his action figures. His small corpse officially made the upscale living room a family plot. Emotionless, Martha lowered the gun. She kept holding it in a steady grip. Steadier than the cold eyes behind the mama mask. Slicing through the tension, a shrill scream erupted from the hallway. What the hell? Walter yelled. No! The wife screamed. She looked towards the hallway. Judy! Walter put the knife to her throat. Who the hell was that? No, please! The wife cried. Trembling, she felt the cold blade touch her neck. It was no one. Kill her! Martha demanded. It was no one! The woman said. Tears poured down her face, a pitiful, helpless sight. I am the only one left. From the hallway, a door slammed shut. Walter glared at the horrified wife. Wrong answer, he said with chilling detachment. Through the tears, the wife cringed. No. In one cool slide, and daddy ended her. Blood shot out of the fatal slice. Drowning in a red sea, the wife gasped for breath. Walter threw it down and rushed towards the hallway. Get them! Martha cried. Oh, I am. And Daddy shouted back. Grasping at her neck, the woman slouched down on one knee. Her breasts grew more desperate and frantic. Her dying eyes stared at me. Her mouth a fountain of overflowing crimson water. I felt nothing, just a hollow heart. And a curiosity compelling me to watch her die. The woman hit the floor, lifeless. Yet another addition to the growing family plot. Her, the child, and the husband formed a deadly triangle. I didn't shield my young eyes. I didn't flinch. Even when the woman's blood flowed to my feet. Amidst the grisly scene, I heard daddy slide his knife along the wall. The blades cry like a whimpering child. Martha pulled me in closer towards her. Even with the gloves and a mask on, I could feel her motherly touch. Go! She yelled towards Walter. Hey, I got her! Daddy yelled in a triumph. Mama and I watched him drag the couple's teenage daughter out of the hallway. She was a younger version of her mother. Let go of me, asshole. The teen yelled out. Straining, she struggled to break free. But daddy was just too strong. And the knife only reinforced his strength. Indifferent, Walter threw her to the floor. Right beside her dead mother. Right into her mother's blood. Is it just her? Martha asked. Yeah, Walter replied. She's the last one. Horror dominated the teenager. More tears poured out. She looked over at all of the corpses. Literally her family's blood was now in her hands. No, she said, her fiery tone reduced to a whimper. Mom. I made eye contact with the daughter. Only I showed no mercy. All I could offer was the blank stare of an intrigued five-year-old. Like the look of a child giving a dying insect. Eager to taunt, Daddy traced a knife along the teen's flowing red hair. Yeah, saving the best for last, he quipped. Get on with it, Martha yelled, jealousy shining through her no-nonsense demeanor. Kill her. Daddy faced her. Oh, let's just have a little fun, with a smile hiding behind his mask. Walter slid the blade down the daughter's face. The teen glared at him, 
blood coated her like mud. Screw you, she screamed. In a flicker of rage, Walter pulled the knife back. Using both hands, Martha squeezed my shoulders. Her bloodlust anticipating this sweet slaughter. Just kill her, Martha demanded. The daughter's defiant glare kept her from being the pitiful sight her mama was. Behind those cold blue eyes, the teen looked just as scary as us. Hoisting the blade up, Walter got ready to plunge it straight into her face. His smiling dad mask more emotionless than an executioner's eyes. Police sirens blared outside. Several of them erupted over and over in a hypnotic loop. Panicking, Walter and Martha looked towards the windows. What the hell? Walter yelled. Martha's hands dug even deeper into my shoulders. What happened? Martha said. Manic laughter echoed through this living room stage. Mama and Daddy confronted the laughing teen. The combination of her wild laugh and the blood drenching through her clothes made her resemble an asylum patient. I called them. She hollered out in a battle cry. Y'all are finished. No, Walter yelled, raising the knife as he charged towards her. Martha reached for Walter, just missing him. Walter, she yelled. Daddy grabbed the teen in a chokehold. Behind mesmerized eyes, I watched him brandish the knife for her scared face. I watched the teen gasp for her desperate breaths. I've got you now, Walter yelled. He raised the weapon. Feeling Martha's tightened grip, I turned to see her looking towards the front door. I could hear footsteps descending upon us, loud yells crashing through the night. The daughter spit in Walter's face. Screw you, she screamed. Angry, Walter wiped the sweat off of his mask. Always the overprotected mother, Martha pulled me into the corner. Walter, come on! Walter shoved the daughter back into the red puddles. Cringing in horror, she screamed. I could hear more footsteps rushing onto the porch. Martha leaned down in front of me. She lifted up the mask. Rather than cold detachment, I saw tears that you could no longer hold. Soft compassion that you could no longer hide. I love you, Blair. Mama said through her tears. Confused, I stared into her hypnotic eyes. At this Martha that I rarely saw. Always remember that. Mama continued in a tender voice. A voice that she wasn't comfortable with. Ready to retaliate, Walter raised the knife over the daughter. Die. Weeping, Martha leaned in and gave me a kiss on the forehead. I love you. The front door burst open. An army of police officers swarmed inside. Police! A cop screamed. Put your hands up. Walter turned and faced them. Terrified, I looked down at Mama. Fighting my tears, she pushed me away. Run. I staggered back in slow, solemn steps. Rather than emptiness, I felt my heart crushed. I felt the glory of the last five years evaporate. An avalanche of tears came tumbling down my eyes. Mom! I screamed. In warrior mode, Mama stood and slid her mask off. Behind the suburban mom face, she confronted the police. No! I shouted in a cry of horror and sadness. One that only the most scared child could ever muster. An officer scooped me up in her arms, her grip tighter than a pair of handcuffs. Drop the weapons, another cop demanded. Like a confident outlaw, Martha raised her pistol. Even she knew that she wasn't getting out of here alive. Walter tore off his mask. I could see foreign emotions sweep over him as well. Behind this serial killer guise, he was always the devoted family man. Martha! He screamed. No, Martha! Gunfire engulfed the room. 
Martha knocked off a few cops with pristine headshots. Their bodies littered the floor, pieces of their brains spilling out like gooey soup. All of them were joining the family plot. The countless bullets finally brought Martha down. Even someone as tough as her couldn't handle that much lead. She fell to the floor. Like bleeding tumors, gunshots ravaged her windbreaker and jeans. Through the mask, her glazed eyes still stared out at me. Mama had gone out in a blaze of glory. Weeping, Daddy stepped towards me. Blair. I turned and I extended my small hand towards him. Our morose moment lingered there like a freeze frame. One that I'll never forget. Daddy. I screamed. I love you, Blair. Dad yelled. The cops aimed at him. I then knew that Dad had no other choice. Fueled by adrenaline, Daddy put on his mask and he took off for the hallway. No, shoot him! The daughter cried. A barrage of bullets erupted, but within seconds, Daddy was gone. Frantic, several police officers charged down the hallway. The manhunt for Walter Friendly had officially begun. I sobbed in the policewoman's arms. I was helpless alone and too young to comprehend the tragedy of the night, to comprehend the tragedy of my life. The female cop toted me outside. Her arms kept me warm from the bitter wind, but not from the sadness eating me inside. In the last hour, I had gone from being a beloved daughter to a traumatized orphan. And deep down, I felt like I had aged from carefree child to abused adult. Out there, I watched the paramedics take the teenage daughter away. She glared at me as they passed by. Blood decorated her face like war paint. Her bright eyes harsher than my daddy's knife. Back then, I felt no sympathy towards her, even though we had both just lost our mothers. I was too young to possess any empathy for anybody except my folks. Of course, my mind was still racing. I still had hope. The dream of being reunited with my dad, especially since the Stanwyck police never found him. My young gaze gravitated towards the surrounding woods, towards the forest running wild behind the house, the exact place where my father must have been hiding. My tears started fading. Even a weary smile crossed my face. The police officer did her best to emulate my mother's wonderful hugs. It's okay, she told me. It's not your fault. But I knew that that was bullshit. Part of this horrifying massacre was my fault. I had been the bait to help us get inside. Only I had even darker secrets than that. Secrets not even Mama knew. For a little father-daughter bonding, Daddy had taken me with him for some of his extracurricular kills, a few stray home invasions here and there. At the age of four, I handled Daddy's knife like a pro, and I used it well when I decapitated Carter Jones. That was my first real kill, and honestly who knows, maybe I did have a hand in killing the husband and wife on that dark night in February, maybe even the little boy as well. I honestly can't remember the specific details after all of these years. But I do know my gaze stayed honed in those woods, and my smile lingered. Five-year-old Blair Friendly knew that Walter was out there, and soon he would come looking for me. Years later, I got adopted by one of those young trendy couples. I guess things were going okay. They were nice then, in a twist of fate. They moved us back to Stanwyck. I got a boyfriend and I made great grades, and for the most part I stayed out of trouble. I was just your average nice teenager. Come to think of it, I wasn't much different than that teenager daddy almost killed that night. The only person to ever survive our attacks. Yesterday, I turned 18. I've kept my darker urges and genes suppressed for quite some time. But now that I'm 18, I feel more free. And I especially will once daddy comes back, once he rescues me from this mundane prison. And then the friendly family will pick up right where we left off.